Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello there. Today we are going to learn how to record an EPR spectrum. And what are the ways that we can get the best quality spectrum? To start with, of course, we need to prepare a sample. And the sample could be of various kind, it could be solid, it could be liquid, it could even be gaseous sample. So, for different types of samples, we need to have sample tubes. So, if it is a solid or liquid, one could use tube of this kind. It is a narrow tube, typically uh, inner dimension of maybe 2 to 3 millimeter and keep the solid here or fill the liquid maybe up to uh, 2, 3 centimeter and uh, insert it inside the cavity. Now, often a liquid sample, most of the solvents dissolve some oxygen and you all know that oxygen is a paramagnetic species. So, this presence of oxygen increases the spin lattice relaxation rate of the paramagnetic species that is we are studying. So, effectively it causes line broadening. Also, it can even kill the free radical that is present there if oxygen reacts with that. So, oxygen is something undesirable, we do not want oxygen in the sample. So, how to remove oxygen from the liquid sample? So, what we can do is to use a sample tube that is shown here, this kind of tube. Now, here we use a vacuum line to remove the dissolved air. It, so, that will remove both oxygen and nitrogen. So, this type of tube which has a small vessel here where the liquid sample is kept and the side arm is similar to this standard EPR tube which can be actually inserted in the cavity. Now, now, this standard joint here is used to connect this to a vacuum line and after degassing this is the place where this could be sealed off and permanently kept under vacuum. Now, how do I remove the dissolved air from this? So, for that these are the steps. So, that is called degassing of liquid EPR samples. So, first we connect this our EPR sample tube after placing the sample here and connect it to the vacuum line and we keep it closed first and this is the stop cock which can either connect to the vacuum line or disconnect it. So, first we freeze this sample by placing it in, in a liquid nitrogen dewar. So, freeze the sample first and then once the sample is frozen, we connect this uh, sample tube to vacuum line by opening the stop cock and remove the air which was trapped there. Once uh, this is uh, evacuated substantially well, we again close the stop cock and then remove this liquid nitrogen from the sample and allow it to thaw to room temperature. As it thaws, this frozen liquid melts and because the pressure is low here, the dissolved air comes out of this and remains here. So, again we come back to this step, freeze it, keeping the stop cock closed. And once it is frozen, I pump the released air from the 
sample here and uh, wait for some time till the vacuum is established. Again close the vacuum line, thaw it and when it thaws whatever residual gas was there or air was there that will again be released. So, that way if you keep on doing it 3, 4 times and if the vacuum line gives reasonably good vacuum let us say 10 to the minus 4 or minus 5 torr then this solvent will almost be free from dissolved air and that is the sample we like to work on. And then we after having reached uh, the desired level of uh, freeze pump and thaw and the degassing of the sample we can seal it here. So, this is the way the sealed sample tube this place is sealed. So, for uh, doing the experiment this liquid is transferred here and then that could be kept inside the cavity. Now, liquid then of course, we can use sample tube of this kind provided this liquid is not very polar. We have seen earlier that polar solvent absorbs microwave and undergoes electric dipole transition. That is nothing but the rotational transition and that is bad we do not want that to happen. So, if the sample is reasonably polar then this sort of sample tube this side down here or here, here they may be sufficiently larger in dimension. So, that the microwave electric field might pay, be influencing the sample here and we can get this sort of transition and that will make the whole thing very insensitive. We do not want this to happen all we want is the magnetic dipole transition to take place. So, one of the common solvents for biological experiment is the water and water you all know is highly polar. So, experiment that ne needs water as a solvent cannot be done in this type of sample tubes that I have shown just now. So, for that one can get around in two ways one is of course, use a capillary. So, the dimension of this tube here instead of 2 to 3 diameter millimeter diameter it will reduce to let us say 1 millimeter diameter and then it may be reasonably acceptable for recording the EPR spectrum, but then very difficult to handle this capillary tubes. So, what one normally does is to use the standard EPR tube like this and then insert the capillary inside uh, there. So, this is the capillary which contains the aqueous sample. Then one could possibly record the EPR spectrum of this sample kept inside the capillary, but this is not quite ideal because the amount of sample that is present here is very small and like any other spectroscopic technique the intensity of the signal will depend on how much sample I put in. So, the smaller the amount less will be the signal. So, unless the sample concentration is very high it is very difficult to get decent signal using a capillary tube. So, there is another way of doing it that is use different type of sample tube and that is shown here this is the core sample tube it is called a flat cell this flat cell is a rectangular chamber of approximately this dimension 5 centimeter long and 1 centimeter wide and this thickness of this is about 0.5 millimeter. So, it is like a rectangular box and these two tubes are to hold the sample tube inside the cavity. Now, the design is such that this being a flat uh, surface and the rectangular dimension and the thin region 
is only 0.5 millimeter. So, if you take a let us say cross section of this kind, so I can ensure that the electric field actually sees only this much of the sample, but the magnetic field can see this much of the sample. So, that way I can minimize the interaction of the electric field with the sample. So, that it has to be placed in the cavity such a way that that condition is satisfied. So, the wider dimension of this should be facing the maximum of the magnetic field and the thinner dimension same time will be at the minimum of the electric field. So, no, that is not very difficult to understand uh, where to place it. This is the cavity rectangular cavity of T 102 mode and we know that at this place exactly here this plane the magnetic field is maximum and electric field is minimum. So, all I need to do is to at this plane I must position this flat cell. So, that I achieve the requirement that the sample will see very little electric field and maximum of the magnetic field. Now, for holding the sample in this cavity, there are of course, holders available which are mounted here and here and for any of these tubes there are corresponding holders. For holding the EPR sample, this flat cell also special holders are available because it is important to realize that it is not only that the flat cell has to be exactly in the center of the cavity, it also has to be oriented properly. So, what I mean by that is that suppose this is the cavity, cavity and the center of this is a center of this a place of maximum magnetic field is somewhere here. So, I need that this plane must be aligned here, but it also has to be aligned such a way that it is need perpendicular to this surface. If there is little bit of mismatch of this kind, then the sample from the edges will see the electric field and that is not good. So, not only it will be at center, also has to be exactly made parallel to this and in this lateral direction front and back also it has to be exactly the center of the cavity. How does one position that? It is not very difficult to do that if we see the cavity moved by reflect modulating the micro frequency. Now, this is the let us say plastron mode and the cavity mode is just superimposed on that. So, this is the cavity mode. When we insert this one, the frequency of the cavity is of course, going to change. So, to start with we take the flat cell and approximately insert in this position. So, that the front surface of the flat cell is almost parallel to this, that is the way we start with and we get the cavity mode here in the middle of this. Now, see that because of the rectangular nature, it has certain symmetry. If you see it once again here, it is symmetric with respect to this plane on both sides. Similar, this is also sort of symmetric with respect to this plane at the center. So, having approximately started with this cavity uh, and the flat cell here, in this position, if I now gently orient it in this direction, then this frequency is going to shift in one direction, it will reach an extreme position again go back in the other direction. Why is that so? Because exactly when the flat cell is parallel to the surface, that is where the frequency is going to be extreme. Now. If it goes this way or that way, the shift in frequency will be same. So, that we can see this is going this way, if we keep turning in one direction and then 
up to 7 it will come out and come back to this opposite direction. So, that way I can find out the optimum placement of this cavity in the flat cell to get the extremum of this. Assumption in that you must start with the initial uh, placement that this is approximately parallel to the desired plane. That is the first part. Second part is to how to ensure that this is indeed center by adjusting this back and forth here. The holders at the top of and bottom of the cavity allows one to have that movement also. So, once again because the cavity has this sort of uh, symmetry plane with this here and see if I the flat cell from the center if it comes this way or that way the change of frequency will be in a similar direction. So, again exactly at the center of the flat cell and it is parallel to this plane this placement uh, appearance of this will be at the extremum that is the way one decides the correct position of the flat cell. For cylindrical cavity there is only a cylindrical symmetry. So, it is not very easy to use similar argument, but the aim is that even in the cylindrical cavity this is the deep let us say. So, when the electric field interaction is minimum this deep will be maximum. So, I must orient the flat cell inside the cylindrical cavity such that I maximize this deep more electric field is seen by the sample poorer will be the q and this will become poorer. So, I can either rotate in the in this axis and see that this becomes deeper and deeper and I try to reach the extreme position and then also move it back and forth to maximize this that is the way to place the sample. If the sample happens to be a gas then it is very simple all we need to do is to have a just a tube and which is insert kept inside the cavity and let the gas be inside. But then this uh, paramagnetic molecules when they collide with each other they change their angle momentum directions. So, that way lines become broad. So, to minimize the collision at the same time to get a decent signal to noise ratio one has to work at a moderate pressure. So, this has to be connected to a vacuum line or a pump a vacuum pump and here the sample goes in. So, that way uh, one can do the experiment. Having inserted the uh, sample and next is to turn on the micro frequency and match the micro frequency to the cavity's own characteristic frequency. For that we modulate the microwave power and see where the cavity dip is. So, in general we may not see any dip. So, we tune the micro frequency using the appropriate knob here and then we should be able to see the deep here it started appearing and we want this frequency to be at the maximum of the micro power that is emitted by the klystron. So, this is the klystron mode and this is the cavity dip which is coming there. So, I tune the frequency. So, more or less this is the correct place. Now, if it is uh, uh, if the micro source is a solid state source a gun oscillator then that mode will not look like this, but it will look like this sort of thing this is the frequency axis and this is the power. So, this is flat that is only difference otherwise it is the same thing. Now, uh, so we get the micro frequency to the uh, maximum of the uh, klystron mode and then we have to optimize the coupling that is this should be very nearly the critical coupled condition. For that 
So, we have to adjust the iris tuning screw which is here. So, we adjust the iris tuning screw so that this dip becomes maximum, but we should not make it over coupled. So, that is you just to turn the screw, the screw, screw is going inside and the dip is increasing and increasing, increasing keep tuning then dip is increasing. Now, this is almost critically coupled. So, you go beyond that you see it is started going on up again. So, this has become over coupled we do not want that go back here. So, this is almost critically coupled we stop here. So, having obtained the nearly critical coupled condition we can now switch off the modulation and turn on the automatic frequency control. But here one important point to be kept in mind is that the bias power that is used to bias the detector is present or not while we are doing this tuning up. So, if you remember let us recall our design of the spectrometer this is the simplest arrangement this is the source of microwave it comes here goes to a percolator this is the cavity which is kept here this is, this is the detector let us call it D and we have a bias power coming from here and through this again mixing there and we have got an appropriate attenuator and a phase shifter. Attenuator phase shifter. So, if the bias power is present the way you have drawn here then detector sees that power all the time. So, in this tuning this will not reach to the bottom of this one because that will give a constant micro power there. So, that has to be kept in mind some spectrometers allows you to switch off this bias power during the tuning period. So, there could be some sort of less symbolically speaking there could be some switch here. to either disconnect this or connect this. So, if that provision is there it is better to switch over the bias power and do the tuning. In that case there will be not be any confusion when the critically coupled condition is reached. But if a, this provision is not there then one should try to bring it to as low as possible and then watch that this does not go up again. So, this dip will probably go down here. So, this may be the bias power. So, you will not be able to bring it below that one. So, then again it will go up. This also assumes that the phase of this is same as this one. Otherwise, these two power will try to cancel each other if the phase is opposite. So, one has to also adjust the phase of the bias power such that I get maximum signal here and I can see the maximum here also. That way also one can start with the bias power to have the appropriate and correct phase with respect to the micro power that is going there. Now, having done that we now switch on the AFC and then ready to start recording the spectrum. First, we need to use certain starting conditions. One is micro power. How much micro power to use to see the spectrum. This is something one does not know a priori, but if you have some idea the sample relaxation time is fairly long and it saturates very easily then one uses low observing microwave power, but if the sample does not saturate very easily one uses high microwave power. So, one starts with some intermediate value of the microwave power. Next the magnetic field modulation amplitude.
typically 100 kilohertz. So, here again one has to decide how much modulation number is to use. So, we start with some intermediate value to start with. Okay. Then the magnetic field range to where the signal is likely to appear magnetic now here and its center. So, these two parameters mean that the region of interest where I expect the signal to appear. So, say this, so let us say this much is the magnetic field I want to scan and search for signal and this is the my center field. And this is the I call it, I call it scan range. These two parameters need to be adjusted. So, how does one decide that? In, again, if one has no idea what sort of G values the sample has, then one really does not know what center field to use and how much scan range to use. So, one usually starts with a reasonably large scan range and assume that G is equal to 2 or so, then keep the center field approximately there and then see if signal is appearing. Having set up this conditions, if we look for signal and scan the magnetic field and find that there is no signal appearing there. Then what happens? What could have gone wrong or can we really change some of the settings and look for signal? One possibility is that the range of this magnetic field is not right. Maybe the G value is such that it is somewhere else. So, if one suspects that G value is equal to 2 or any other known values, then from the micro frequency new, you can find out the center field by this this formula. So, if you have some idea what this is, then you keep the center field approximately the value that you calculate from the micro frequency and put it here and then have a large scan range and then try again see if the signal appears there or it is possible that a that I may be scanning too little or then you can increase the scan range or it is possible that even then the spectrum is somewhere else in that case I can but that is a assumed G value is not what I what is right. So, I can go somewhere else then change the scan center field somewhere else again scan it. It is possible then that the modulation amplitude was not appropriate enough. Maybe it was giving too a small signal. We will see later that it may even give broadening of line if the modulation amplitude is very high. So, again you change this parameter and see if the signal comes or not. Maybe the micro power was either too high which is causing saturation and this the signal was not appearing or maybe it is too little. So, the signal also was not coming. So, keep on adjusting this and look for signal. So, in spite of all this suppose the signal really is not coming then what can one conclude? One obvious conclusion will be the sample is not paramagnetic either all the preparation of samples and whatever you have done to bring the sample to the cavity you may, may have just died. That is too bad we have to start all over again. On the other hand if there is strong reason to believe that it is indeed paramagnetic and still the sa sa sample is not giving a PR signal the way you have done it and what I of course implicitly assume that we are doing it at room temperature. It is possible therefore, that the relaxation time is so fast or the, that it does not give signal at a room temperature then one has to go to lower temperature. Maybe liquid nitrogen temperature which is 77 Kelvin or even 
liquid helium which corresponds to 4 Kelvin. So, maybe you will get some signal that time. Now, having done all this, let us say we have seen some signal now. What are the adjustments we can do to optimize the quality of the spectrum? First thing is to do is to adjust this. Suppose our signal has appeared in this fashion. So, this is the range of magnetic field I have scanned and it is appearing some, some sort of signal appears here. This sort of thing. So, first we do is to it is obvious that the scan range was too much and also that it is not the center of the spectrum. So, I first change the center field. This was the center field earlier, I now bring the center field here. So, center field is brought here. Then again I scan the magnetic field and get the spectrum. This time it will look like this. So, it will look like this type of thing. So, now since this much of magnetic field is not doing anything, it is simply compressing the spectrum here. So, to do proper measurement, let us have a coupling constant or line position. In other words, to get a more resolved spectrum, we do not need to scan this region. So, reduce the scan range. Instead of this, now new scan range could be let us have this much, new scan range. Again, you check out the spectrum. So, this time this may look like this is a new scan range which has been expanded this fashion. So, it may look like this type of thing. So, this is much better now we can do some measurement, but is that all or we can uh, improve it further. As I said earlier, now we can try to increase the micro power and see if we can get better quality spectrum. Micro power will cause more efficient transition and signal intensity will go up provided recall our discussion earlier of the saturation of the spin system and the relaxation mechanism which are present there. So, these two will also work such a way that you cannot increase the micro power too much without bringing in saturation. So, the way it will behave is that EPR signal intensity intensity and the micro power if you think the square root of that this will increase linearly first it means increase the micro power the signal height will go up and up and up in this in this fashion and then it will start showing some sort of saturation and goes down here. So, in this place where the relaxation mechanism is not able to maintain the population difference. So, we cannot use this much power and lose the signal height intensity of the signal. So, we have to decide that somewhere here we can stop and not increase the micro power. So, we get bigger signal in the process. Next is this modulation amplitude, how to optimize that. This is the principle of magnetic field modulation and phase sensitive detection. So, here we have come across this slide earlier, but let us recall once again, this is the amplitude of the magnetic field modulation and this is the corresponding response of the sample to the modulated magnetic field. So, it is obvious that not only this amplitude depends on the position of the magnetic field and that is the reason of course, uh, for the derivative presentation of the EPR signal. It also amplitude of this also depends on how big this is. If I increase this amplitude, this will also increase, this if this is increased, this will also increase. So, the EPR signal is going to increase with the increase of the modulation amplitude, but to get a true line shape that is line shape is exactly the derivative of this absorption profile, this should not be too much. So, the in signal will have this sort of dependence on the magnetic field modulation amplitude.
go this way, then it will go down here. By the way, by intensity I mean here the height of the signal, not the area of that, so the, this, the height of this signal here. So, this is linearly increasing and then it will start going down when the modulus amplitude becomes comparable to the line width. So, when that happens the intrinsic line width of this, this here, this is the intrinsic line width and correspondingly there will be derivative line width that will start showing distortion and the, the IPR signal will become broad. So, if suppose this is the EPR signal at a moderate amplitude of the modulation, this will height will go up and up as you increase the modulus amplitude, but then when this modulus amplitude becomes comparable to this width, this will show broadening of this kind. So, that is not desirable. So, one has to make some compromise. The way let us say another axis here, this is let us say width let us call. This delta B peak to peak is defined to be this one delta V peak to peak that is the width of the derivative line. So, that will have this sort of dependence on the modulus amplitude, it will remain almost constant then it starts going up. So, the width remains constant so long as the amplitude of modulation is much smaller than its own width here. So, that is the true line width of the sample, but as signal goes up this also up to uh, remains constant. So, this is the desirable region of operation, these are the high acceptable, this is ok, but somewhere here now intensity is going down and width is going up is not acceptable, because this gives distortion. So, that way one decides how much magnetic field modulation is to be used here. Sometimes one can sacrifice the line shape and get the EPR signal, because when you are trying to struggling to find if at all there is EPR line or not, you really do not care if the shape is correct or not. So, then one works somewhere here this region, where there is some sort of distortion of the width, but nevertheless signal is somewhat bigger than what is supposed to be if it was not, uh, uh, if one was using smaller amplitude of modulation. So, some distortion, but slightly higher intensity is preferable or even acceptable if one is interested only in detecting the presence of the radical and getting some sort of your signal there. And then after adjusting this next uh, parameter to be adjusted is how much time I should use to scan this magnetic field range. This is called the scan time. The scan time, how many minutes or how many seconds it depends on how quickly the magnetic field is going through these lines. If the lines are very sharp, then one should spend enough time for spectrometer to respond sufficiently quickly to the changing signal here. Now, how does one decide that uh, uh, quantitatively? After the phase detection and the derivative signal has been recorded, one usually puts a what is called the low frequency filter time constant low frequency filter with a time constant let us say T. That means, any signal or noise whatsoever oscillations whose frequency is uh, faster than 1 by T will not be given out, but it will be filtered out. For example, if I t is equal to 1 second time constant, that means any oscillations or instability which is more than 1 hertz, 1 hertz will be 
effectively reduced. So, depending on what time constant I use here, I must allow several times this time constant for the magnetic field to go through this line. So, the narrower the line, let us say, let us say one line is this narrow, other is broad. So, it has to go through sufficiently slowly through this one compared to this time constant, so that this is faithfully reproduced. So, typically time to go through a line should be let us say about greater than 10 times the time constant. This is time constant which is used to filter out the signal, so that the spectrometer has sufficient time to slowly go through this. So, that depends on the how broad and how narrow it is. If it is very narrow, then it will take a long, it should once should allow longer time, if it is broad then one does not need to have that much time. So, here is a small uh, guide number. Suppose the line width is 0.5 Gauss and you scan 10 Gauss and time constant is 1 second. So, I should give 10 second to scan 0.5 Gauss, 10 times time constant to, to go through this one. So, that means to scan 10 Gauss which is the range from this to this, I have to give a time of 200 second to scan 10 Gauss. That is the way one decides the scan time and a little bit more of final adjustment is sometimes necessary, not always is the phase of the modulation frequency, which is usually set up uh, by the manufacturer and some often one does not change that very often, but if the one can see things have got disturbed or not, one can just tweak the reference phase of this one to maximize the signal. And also the bias power phase which we have said that we could optimize by looking at the cavity mode which may also need to be adjusted a little bit to maximize the EPR signal. So, these are the various parameters which need to be optimized to get the best quality signal to noise ratio. With this we come to an end of this session. <laughs>